a sort of sort of half glass full of unsqueezed lemonade, right? There seems to be a, uh, this Christian consensus that women should not have power to make their own decisions on behalf of their own body. But when did she lose that power? In popular cultural accounts of the Adam and Eve story, Satan the serpent is often portrayed as, as this cunning deceiver that fools Eve into eating the apple from a fruit tree, who in turn curses humanity. Um, when we observe the actual biblical account, there's no long, drawn-out argument or debate. There's no personal dismay or temptation from Eve. The conversation is, in fact, a grand total of five statements, five exchanges. It takes less than 30 seconds to read. All evil stems from this stupid girl. Not a fooled girl, not a, not a smart girl that was fooled. She was essentially, from the very beginning, a stupid girl. Apparently she has no foresight of the possible consequences of her actions. And so God lays down a personal punishment for the serpent and the woman. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. In 16, he says, unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There are several things that might go unnoticed in reading these passages. Uh, in verse 15, God establishes, establishes a permanent relationship between Satan and the woman. From that point forth, Satan has a, now has a special interest in the woman that cursed him. From this point forth, Satan is instilled by God a certain kind of animosity that now supercharges his will to work great deeds of evil through the woman so that it becomes necessary for God to discipline the woman, especially her habitual need to sin. The woman is now untrustworthy, for she is a co-worker of Satan. In his next vulgar display of power, God curses childbirth for all women, yet states that women will continue to have desire or lust for their husbands. Let's not forget to mention that now she is officially within his dominion. So is this where the ideas concerning rape and incest and banning abortion come together to form this pro-life personhood ideology? If childbirth is a gift and a punishment, it seems logical that pregnancy due to rape fits perfectly snug within, within these parameters. Since men are now responsible for women, then perhaps the man can force the woman to make better decisions and not be fooled again. Such is the case with Virginia Governor Bob McDonald, a.k.a. Governor Ultrasound, who passed a bill in March 2012 requiring women to have a transvaginal ultrasound before being eligible to have an abortion so that she can see the life she's murdering, or more specifically, the commandment that she's breaking. The need to silence and to regulate women becomes a central theme to the Bible and even in mainstream discourse, from Judaism to Orthodox Christianity, to Islam, to so-called modern Christianity. There are numerous exploits of the woman we can choose from in the Bible. In Genesis alone, it was difficult for me to narrow it down. But I've decided to, to interpret the story of Lot. This is nephew of Abraham. Here we'll also find this is one of the first stories to establish direct moral laws to be placed upon humanity. Before we begin, let's refresh uh, why Eve was created in the first place. Verse 18, he says, uh, man needs a helper. 19, God presents Adam all creatures to name. Adam gives names to the cattle, etc. Lord causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep, takes out one of his ribs, creates a woman from his rib. And then Adam said, this is now bone of my, blow, my, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God then proceeds, so God proceeds to present every living animal to Adam so that he may give them names. God decides to create animals first for Adam to name. Then afterwards, as seemingly as like an afterthought, he decides to create another animal for Adam, this time the woman. Eve is in fact a secondary human. 
And she was made at the same time the Lord was making animals. There's a deep, deep implication here of ownership when you have the power to name something. In Genesis, Yahweh's first instruction to Adam was not something practical, like making a fire or making a bow. He teaches the first man to name all his creatures. By this act, Yahweh emphasizes that naming is the most potent power he will confer onto mortals. Through naming, Adam gains dominion over all the earth. Naming confers meaning. To name is to know, and to know is to control. Women now have a name, just like cattle. Women have yet to shake this tradition, for once they marry, they're usually forced to accept their husband's surname, immediately after they escape their father's surname. Now we'll focus on this excer excerpt uh, from Lot's story. And this has a really interesting twist. This time it's a woman guilty of raping a man. So Lot's wife dies toward the end of his life. His daughters are thoroughly concerned that his father, their father was too advanced in age to find another wife and to have at least one male progeny. So the daughters, well his firstborn daughter, decides to get her father drunk from wine and have sex with him. Once again, we see the woman engaging in foolish behavior, not to mention perversion, with no foresight or ability to imagine consequences. His daughter, thinking she was engaged in some higher ordered good, rapes her father to preserve his seed, never realizing that this conception would be saturated in sin. This is yet another example of a woman who is far too stupid to make rational choices on her own. The older daughter convinces the younger sister to also rape the father. Reflecting on these passages, I began to feel that the female character of the Bible was parasitic, clownishly dumb, in need of discipline, punishment, and most importantly, training. Man is the victim while the feminine evil is still at large here. So now we'll get to the question of does God hate facts? Now we've established a clear biblical hierarchy. It must be male over female. I held really high hopes that I could somehow contribute to the reconciliation between homosexuality and Christians. I used all the popular ploys, quoting scriptures, relaying the, you know, love thy neighbor, casting the first stone story. But I learned that there is no hope. None. I realized that I had been living in a comfortable state of denial and delusion that reassured me that the Bible didn't really say that much about gayness. Therefore, maybe it's up for debate or interpretation. I was wrong. Disappointed, I moved on in an attempt to better understand why such vicious hatred of gays exists in the Christian culture, only to discover that the reason is really, really simple. There's no space for the homosexual to exist within the confounds of the Bible's stringent binary gender construction. There's no, there's no space between male and female. There are only two genders. Taking notes from linguistic scholar uh, Kira Hall, I came across this concept of third gender. Synonym in, in, in Hindi for transvestites, hermaphrodites, homosexuality, etc. Uh, deep into her research, she uncovers hints and clues, and clues that perhaps through hinder, hinder, Hindu gender construction, there is no third gender. Instead, a space of ambiguity, a no gender, that is neither male nor female, insufficiently each, therefore neither, and unidentifiable. So when we listen to the popular Christian, Christian heckle, God hates, I'm um, sorry, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. The transparency of the biblical binary imagination becomes illuminated. Since the Christian community and its male leaders pay extra attention to gay males, I'll present them as the heretical archetype 
keeping in mind that this is all applicable to the, hom to the homosexual female. In our English language, the absence of neutered pronouns, him, she, his, her, adds rank confusion and negates the continuous spectrum of, of gender that we know exists. Um, the only left word to describe, let's say, a hermaphrodite or a cross-dresser is the word it, which implies not human or something other than. When we look into the phrase Adam and Steve, we find something peculiar. One may easily overlook that Eve's name is still found within the spelling of Steve. I suggest that this is not only a clever rhyme scheme, but an attempt to describe one of the males as ins insufficiently masculine, therefore not really male. I assert that the homosexual is not a third gender, but a third type of human, which cannot, in this case, this third type cannot be fully male when Eve's incompetent femininity is carved into its soul. But at the very least, Eve had the sacred capability of, procre of procreation, unlike the third type, which kind of leaves some Christians thinking, why do they even exist? The reason the homosexual can never be accepted into the Christian community is because the third type tilts the foundation of the binary ideological institution. And by accepting this anomaly, the it, it corrupts and blasts open a space where law is lawlessness. The natural order of binary biblical thought and patriarchal hierarchy collapses into confusion when presented with a person that's immune from genderization, that doesn't fit into gender categories. How can we polarize the genders and define male versus female, define opposite sexes, when the third type human is neither? Recognition of the third type human is not possible because the proper hierarchy of male over female is just too important to the Bible. And by extension, it's too important to God. So does God hate fags? I'm not sure. I don't think he says enough. But I'm 100% positive that the Bible condones and enforces gender oppression. But does the average Christian hate, hate gays? That's a better question. But I will say with confidence that I think God hates women. To conclude, my task was to, con to convince you guys that the Bible exists in a 100% binary plane of existence, binary paradigm. We stayed mostly within the first several pages of a book thousands of pages long. But already, so early in the Bible, within the first pages, we see patterns of gender formulations, gender behavior, and gender task assignments. I argue that God, the divine author of this book, has the, has the mind of a male who is interested in preserving male superiority by slandering the rival gender. My stance is that the Bible provides a clear wall of separation and enforces gender inequality as normalcy. But if we as society were to become more aware of genderization and binary thoughts in the Bible, then perhaps, it's, perhaps it might be possible to shift vast sections of the Christian cultural climate and speed up our journey towards gender equality. We can see the simplest forms of genderization. For example, the morally eroded city of Babylon is described as the great whore. And today we focus on the more covert versions of gender bias. Christians must take a critical look into the book that helped create Western society. We must take a better look in what created, what created Western society, what helped create America and the Christian nation as we know it. But we as progressives, we can help them along. And if not, we'll just drag them into the 21st century, right? Thanks. Take any questions if you guys have any. Um, what's your opinion on, you know, in Jewish, in Jewish religion, Eve wasn't the first woman, it was another woman? I, 
Lilith? Yeah, Lilith. What do you, what's your opinion on Lilith, Lilith? Lilith is found in a side account um, in one of the Gnostic Gospels, which is not included in the Bible. Since it's not included in the Bible, it's considered heretical. I'm not really sure about the Jewish religion, but I know that the Christian religion sees all of those books as heresies. There's a, there's a Gospel of the Savior, which is allegedly written by Jesus. There's a Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Thomas and Thecla. There's actually a woman uh, Gospel in there. There's a Gospel of Mary Magdalene. But all of those are heresies. So the Christian religion would say, you know, Lilith didn't exist. It, it's not in the Old Testament, therefore she doesn't exist. Yes? The actual title of the presentation, the actual title of this paper is called The Natural Ordered Sexes, Covert Gender Discourse in Biblical, Tra in Biblical Traditionalism. Of course, you can't really put that on a, you know, on a fucking flyer. Nobody's going to see that shot. Yeah, because it's thrown off by, by the title on there. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people actually. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. Any questions? Um, well, I thought you had a really good uh, argument and insights, uh, but I just want to get your opinion. Uh, like, do you think sexual dimorphism had a lot to do with the power negotiations as far as like men controlling the women? Because as you know, like men uh, biologically are larger; uh, they have uh, more muscle mass stuff like that, and uh, maybe that's why, like, it's something that's plausible to consider. That. There's an interesting transition in history, specifically when trans transitioned into Judaism. Before that, there was a, there wasn't a male supreme authority. It was always a goddess. It was always a female god that gave birth, that had the power, power of life, it wasn't until Judaism that that actually gets switched around. Even, even in Greek mythology, you did have Zeus, but you also had other females and other clans of gods that could kill Zeus if they wanted to. So I think, as far as us being physically larger, maybe that played a role thousands of years ago. I think eventually it calmed down a little bit when we were worshiping female goddesses, and then when Judaism came around, and kind of stuffed out those very slowly. And then this male monotheistic leaning of, of, of people, I think that's what actually established this male hierarchy. I don't think anything else did. Because, I mean, religion was rapid, you know, it's, it was everywhere back then. Everybody had some kind of superstition. Yeah. <laughs>